You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. And welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt. And I'd like to begin our proceedings here today by calling out to the helping spirits to be with us. So I call out first to your good, true, and beautiful ancestral helping spirits, and I call out to my own. I call out to these people who walked the earth, lived in their own time, and rose to the challenges that were presented to them. And I call out to these ancestors, ask them to lean in and to help us, the living, rise to the challenges in our own time. Help us to find a true and authentic expression of ourselves and to give what it is we have to bring to the world in a way that is good for all living things. And we ask these ancestors to lean in and help us do it now so we can do it now in time for those who are coming. And as these human ancestors gather around us, let us take a nice deep breath and reach beyond the humans into all of the ever older ancestors, those beings in many forms that create this great web of life, all these energies that were here long before there were ever humans and will be here long after. And I reach out to the spirits of the land, to the plants, to the animals, to the bugs, to the elements, to the geography, to all the many energies that even the little microorganisms that create the great web of life that we are all part of. And I ask these ancestors, these who are nature, to help us to remember our own truest nature, that which makes the human being unique in the whole system of things here on earth. And I ask these ancestors to help us to remember how to express our own humanity in ways that support the humanity of others and to support the uniqueness and the diversity in all living things. So as these ancestors in their many forms lean in to help us here today, let's gather ourselves from wherever we might be and call ourselves from wherever that is into our head. Take another nice deep breath and exhale and draw your energy into your heart. Another nice deep breath and exhale, draw the energy into your belly. And then let your energy settle down in as you reach to the earth in your imagination or perhaps in your physical reality. And take a moment to touch the earth and to give thanks for your life. Gratitude for this day. Give thanks for the wonder, the awe that is life on earth. And give gratitude to the earth and all that she gives so that we could share life here today. Making your gratitude real and immediate in this moment, let it extend down, giving thanks to all the layers of the earth, reaching all the way down into the very center of the earth. And take a moment uh, within yourself of stillness to connect into these energies that draw their strength through the essence of darkness, of silence and stillness. And let that peace that permeates this energy begin to bubble up like a fresh, uh, cool spring water bubbling up out of the earth on a hot day to reach into that energy of the earth and draw it up into your own being, into your day, into these proceedings. And in this way, we draw up the wisdom of manifestation and learn from the earth how to be here in form in a good way. We draw up those energies that nourish and replenish and restore. And we connect with that energy that is before it is a thing. And to settle in and to remember that we have access to that which is before. And that which brings abundance here into your life and into the lives of others. 
And so as we draw this energy up, continuing to hold it in great gratitude in our heart, let us connect into the earth to know who we are, where we stand, what we stand for, and to set the intention and to take the actions to build a life that is built on what has heart and meaning for you, what you value, what you are willing to engage the day to make more present here on earth. And we give gratitude to the earth for all the ways it teaches us of connection and interconnection and how it is that all of these great diverse energies can be here in a way that is harmonious, a way that brings beauty, a way that expresses complexity, and a way that is truly awe-inspiring, reminding us that there is magic inherent in all things. And feeling into that magic that is inherent in you and in all that you connect with, let yourself settle into right relationship with yourself, with others, with the environment, right relationship with the spirit world. And as you come into right relationship, begin to gather your own energy and send it up through your body to your heart, up to your mind, up and out the top of your head and all the way out through the sky and whatever weather it holds out through the atmosphere, all the way up into the cosmos, reaching for that energy that is the highest power of the universe in your own understanding, your own way you conceive it, whatever name you call it, if you call it a name, reach out to this energy and merge with it, connect to it, let it connect with you, and draw this energy down, down through all the layers of the sky, and into your space, into your body, into these proceedings here today, continuing to send it all the way down to the center of the earth. In this way, we bring in the energy of blessing and choose to receive it and to give it. We bring in the energy of protection and we choose to receive it and to share it. We draw in the benevolence of our universe and endeavor to radiate that benevolence out to others. We call in the inspiration and the illumination. We call out to that energy that can allow us to be a lighthouse in the storms that others experience. We call out to this divine radiant energy, allow it to fill us and remind us where we come from. And as we send this energy down to the center of the earth and let these two great legendary lovers, the earth and the sky, come together within us, let this big love, these two energies share, awaken the spirit of our own heart. And as that heart spirit awakens for you in this day, let it be nourished by the energies below, inspired by the energies above. Let yourself feel your own desire to do what it is that you've come to do in this life and to find some courage in that human heart to take action in some way in this day to make your own gifts more fully manifest and more freely given to the world. And for all the spirit help that we all have to do exactly that, I give great thanks. May what needs to be said be said here today and what needs to be heard be heard. And may these proceedings go forward in a way that is good for all living things. Uh, for those of you that don't know, because you're stuck in quarantine and you've listened to all your other favorite podcasts and so you finally just found us, Why Shamanism Now is listener supported and uh, there are bills to pay to keep the show and the archives on the air and available to anyone anywhere in the world who has access to the internet um, and these uh, resources are available to you because people, listeners like you, have donated humble amounts, usually five, maybe ten dollars, or the equivalent in any currency. We are welcome. Uh, we welcome all of it. It all pays the bills to keep the show available. And so, first of all, today I want to thank those of you who have donated for years. Literally, you set up a monthly donation and have donated to why shamanism now literally four years i am grateful to you especially those of you who have found at this time when we are uh sheltering at home and remain in quarantine and many of your lives have been drastically changed 
by these changes uh, shared around the globe that you've had to withdraw your payments, uh, your donations. I want to say thank you to you and thank you for your discernment. Thank you for taking care of yourself. And I invite those of you who listen and have never donated, if you are able, to reach out and do so now. And uh, let there be a changing of the guard. Let those of you that find this show a resource in your life now, that if it moves you, even if it moves you to irritation and frustration, you have been moved in the heart. And this uh, is essential in our shamanic work. And so please do something, large or small, to support the show and allow that movement in your heart to motivate your actions in the world. So thank you, everyone that uh, donates to keep the show available. I'd also like to continue uh, weekly to thank those people that are keeping our lives happening, those people that are keeping food in our grocery stores, those people working the fields, those people driving the trucks or the trains, those people at the grocery stores, and all uh, the many, many people um, in all the support roles that keep the electricity on, everything. I'm grateful to the hospital staffs all around the world as they work overtime in the United States in very extreme circumstances, given the nature of our leadership. Um, Big, big gratitude to you all, all of you who are literally uh, involved in the effort to help us all figure out what does it mean to live in a pandemic that is truly global? What does it mean to be a global citizen. As we continue to educate ourselves in this way, I want to give gratitude to everybody who is making sure I still have a food to make dinner tonight and I still have electricity to be able to record this show and talk to you all. And I give uh, enormous gratitude to all of you who are doing what you need to do in your own life to keep you and your family and your children sane and well. And that is the topic of today, mental wellness in pandemic time. (laughs) We are live today. It is April 21st, uh, 2020. And as I've been saying, much of the human population of this globe remains in quarantine in an effort to diminish the rate of spread of COVID-19 around the globe. If you are listening live and you have a question about today's topic, you are welcome to call in at 512-772-1938, or you can Skype in from the co-creatornetwork.com site. And if you're listening uh, later, not live, you're always welcome to email me at christina at lastmaskcenter.org. And for those of you that are new listeners, you can go to whyshamanismnow.com to find hundreds of hours of um why shamanism now shows on the practical application of shamanism in your contemporary life Um, and you can go to lastmaskcenter.org to find not only our retreats but our online classes okay so there's a whole bunch of things i should be talking to you about this week and honestly i am getting tired of them (laughs) And what I've really noticed in uh, the recent week is uh, issues um, of waves of mental wellness uh, and mental unwellness and mental illness. And so for new listeners, go dive on into the archives. Um, For those of you that have been listening for years, you know that mental illness is understood very differently through the eyes of different cultures. Um, There is a whole series of shows in the archives about understanding what is typically labeled mental illness in the United States from a very different perspective. You know, what do different kinds of supposedly mental illness diagnoses, what do they look like through the eyes of a shaman? And particularly shamans from different cultures. So in those shows, and frankly many other shows, I've often talked about what I feel is more realistic to talk about mental health as mental wellness and mental unwellness. And then a prolonged state 
or a chronic state of mental unwellness moves us into mental illness. And so really at, at, at the heart of the question from a shamanic perspective in terms of us as people in any time is how are we living our individual life and our communal life in a way that allows us to cultivate mental wellness or in a way that tears at our mental wellness, moves us into mental unwellness. So, for example, in the United States, um, a black woman right, could do excellent cultivation of her mental wellness – but be faced daily in this country with uh, constant daily microaggressions that would just eat away at her, uh, potentially, could potentially eat away at her mental unwellness. And none of that has moved us in a territory that I would call mental illness from a shamanic perspective. Okay, so, <laughs> so what is mental wellness and the corresponding mental unwellness in a pandemic time? So, I want to qualify this show before I go any further, um, because we are in a time of quarantine, and I do believe that we are all in the same boat from the perspective of life on Earth. Earth is our little boat. We don't have another place to live yet, and so we all need to figure out how to live here in a good way with all the rest of life that is necessary for life as a whole. To proceed. So from that perspective, yes, we are all in the same boat and we are learning powerfully about how our actions exponentially affect each other. And at the same time, we are not experiencing the same parts of that great ship that for some people, this experience in this boat sucks massively, that their entire industry has collapsed it may or may not rejuvenate itself. But so, for example, just a simple example, I don't personally enjoy cooking. Nothing wrong with cooking. Love all of you who do. I don't personally like it. I go out to eat fairly regularly in my home in Portland, Oregon. At the sort of general places I go out to just for regular, I don't want to cook tonight dinners, many of the wait staff. Uh, work at many of the same restaurants that I go to. You know, they have two nights at this restaurant and two days over here at this restaurant, and they work the weekends over here. And I see them in all these different places. Okay, I haven't seen those people for two months, right? Because we've all been quarantined and those restaurants aren't offering takeout. So these people's lives have collapsed, right? So their experience in this lovely boat is far different than mine, Whereas I already had a portion of the work that I do as online classes anyway. You know, I'd already started three years ago in that. So I want to acknowledge those people that are facing um, real frightening issues in a career or a profession they've dedicated their whole adult life to, possibly, that is very uncertain right now. So so this show I'm offering is qualified. I want to respect those people that are in a situation where listening to a show about how to work on your mental wellness right now is not really what they want to be doing or need to be doing because things are much more survival-based in their lives right now. And that's fine. And if you still want to listen to the show in that state, bless your heart and thank you. Um, I'm really inviting those of us who are not facing real in-your-face issues, you're just basically annoyed with still being quarantined, to look for how you could potentially support people who are really looking at the potential end of their life as they knew it. Um, some of these people are artists. And I don't personally want a world without art. Maybe you do. That's up to you to decide. But how could those of us who are not really stretched to the edge of breaking consider helping in a real way, in a realistic way, 
helping those who are right now. So I'm also um, inviting those of us who are not faced with dire consequences in this moment to consider investing in our own mental wellness, to not indulging in the freedom to do nothing right now, but to engage in this time as an opportunity to become a resource, not just a source, but a resource, a touchstone for others, for your own hearty, resilient mental wellness. And for those of you where that just is not happening, it is too scary, I would encourage anyone who needs resources for dealing and managing with fear that is present in their lives every day to go to Sounds True. I'm not even, I don't even know where my link is. I'm not even promoting this for myself. Sounds True has been doing an excellent job offering a free resource called Resiliency in a Time, in Challenging Times. Let me get the title right. Yep, Resilience in Challenging Times. It is free resource and they are adding material to it all the time. It is really a beautiful offering. So for those of you that need something less um, irritating than me today, I would suggest you go to Sounds True. I, I know I've been hawking this, but I really am constantly impressed by the content that they're adding month after month, week after week. Okay. Now, for the rest of us, those of us who are not facing real and present danger today, let's consider how to be part of a solution larger than ourselves. And the foundation of this will be our mental wellness in the rocky and uncertain times ahead. Because someday they are going to let us all out of the house, right? And who is going to come strolling out your front door at that time, right? That is the question of the day. So let's face it. Many people are already really bored. The novelty has certainly worn off. And uh, the baseline stress of the unknown that is present in every day is taking its toll on people, all different kinds of people, right? And again, for those of you that have experienced the death of a loved one, for those of you that are working exceptionally hard because you've been deemed an essential worker, bless your heart and thank you. For the rest of us, right, uh, we're bored, right? So what are we going to do about that? So what I noticed last week is that there's a certain uh, – overall set of short fuses that pretty much burned down last week to the to the nubbin right and that those people uh, around that have had an already established pattern of mental illness in their own being um many of these people's fuses burned down the whole uh shelter in place fuse just burned down for them and Last week got really weird that uh, a lot of people just flipped out of that thin line of mental wellness that they could manage into the full-blown old patterns many of them haven't been in for a decade. Okay, so how do we begin to raise the field for all of us so that we can manage this situation in a better way because mental wellness becomes mental unwellness and then sustained days and weeks and months of mental unwellness can tip over into problematic patterns of mental illness, right? So my question for us all this week is, so how long or short is your fuse, right? What are you discovering about your hardiness, what are you discovering about your resiliency? What is the real value of your shamanic practice in your everyday life? So everybody's run off to say, what's the shamanic message in the virus? Okay, now that we're all past that, in what way are you using your skill set 
to cultivate your resiliency and your hardiness and the robust quality of your mental wellness. So if you're noticing that you have actually tipped, you've crossed that gentle line between mental wellness to mental unwellness, that you're noticing your addictions are really flaring up, you're starting to lean into those groups that are talking about, oh, you shouldn't worry about the fact that you can't get anything done right now, and things like that. All right, the, these, these voices that would encourage you to settle in to a kind of low-grade, a little bit depressed, very stagnant repetition of the same valueless, meaningless actions that contribute nothing to what your heart is longing for in your everyday life. All right. So what I'm asking us all to look at is now that we're in quarantine, does our normal The mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical wellness of the individuals in this family are the, are the priority at this time. So what I've observed as I've watched this in myself uh, and others um, is that I often find myself contemplating this word essential that is being used a lot these days and asking, you know, dropping into deep contemplation what is essential? So with this question rolling around in my life as I'm doing work, um, I have reread a number of my favorite big epic stories over the time we've been in quarantine. So in one of these, not just stories, it's actually, unfortunately, the author's dead now, but um, way too soon. But anyway, in, in one of the worlds that many of these epic stories are written in, it's a world um, that's out in the galaxy with basically bipedal, not even necessarily bipedal, just the beings that live out in the universe, in the galaxy. Sorry. And um, what's interesting about that reality is the diversity um, people, well, beings, they don't work because there's no need to because there's no shortage of resources. Um, what's interesting about this this uh, confederation of beings, I would say, is that, that the humans from Earth haven't been allowed in yet because we are not evolved enough yet. Uh, we don't, ex we don't uh, cultivate a, a normal base level of mental wellness that is well enough to be part of this confederacy and so what's interesting about this confederacy is because the people don't work they don't need to work they don't need there's no money there's no need to earn money because there's more than enough resources for everyone so there's a whole lot of social injustice etc that doesn't exist because the fundamental economic situation doesn't exist so what do people do right what do the beings do all day right well this is what I love about just the background of the otherwise epic tale that he's telling is the background of this confederacy of these hugely diverse beings and, and what they're doing in the, in the background of the story that's being told with the protagonists and et cetera. And what the people are doing is exploring they, deeply. So they're very deeply exploring whatever their interests are. 
not just dabbling, that they're, they're, they're deeply exploring their interests and connecting across the galaxy with others who are also exploring that interest. They're, they are deeply indulging and following paths of their own curiosity about things. And people are, you know, random people are inventing things that, you know, save beings of a you know an aquatic life form that lives sentient life form in some other galaxy but the point is they're they're engaging deeply in what interests them because they've got potentially three four hundred years of life ahead of them and one of the things that people do by choice is work now, some of the work is making music, playing instruments, making art, um, making things in general. They don't need to make things because everything can be manufactured. They do it because it's satisfying. Even if a machine could make it better, they choose to make it because they enjoy the craftsmanship and the job well done. There's something satisfying in having a project that matters, not just keeping busy, but – and that's what's interesting about this world that's been created by Ian Banks is that people are not keeping busy. When they're not busy, they could sit and contemplate. They can go be hermits. They can explore a lot of silence, a lot of solitude. Nobody's going to stop them. Lots of ways to do it technologically and otherwise. Lots of planets that are preserved entirely as nature reserves to go be out in nature. But they do what they do as an expression of who they are. Not just who they already are, but to discover who they aren't yet. Now, yeah, okay, there's also a lot of people in this confederacy that, that you know, wildly modify their body, giving themselves wings and seven penises and go to sex parties constantly with crazy drugs and carry on and on. But in 400 years of life, even that eventually gets boring. Eventually, these beings need to pursue themselves not in a solipsistic, selfish way, but in from a place of curiosity. Who am I and why am I here? And so this then makes me ponder, so what is essential? And what I have found accidentally, mostly, throughout life, is one of the things that is essential to deeply root mental wellness is to be exploring deeply who you are and why you're here. It's not a luxury. It is actually essential. So one of the first things I figured out accidentally came entirely because I am um, not the easiest person to live with. And what I realized with the epic um, flow of relationships and no relationships and getting into another relationship and no relationship and the feedback that I received in that um, and the feedback that I received in general from life about me is that it was very likely that I would spend my entire life alone. <laughs> I figured that out fairly young, my very early 20s, that because of things I refuse to compromise about within myself, etc., doesn't really matter why. The point is I eventually came to realize you are going to spend the majority of your life alone. And then I thought, hmm, okay, well, given that, it's probably really important for me to decide that I actually – like myself. If I'm going to spend my whole life with me, I need to be someone who is interesting to me. And this is, of course, uh, not meant in any sort of self-centered, um, 
limited or limiting aspect of just exploring myself. It's really more practical. It's realizing that there is one person you will spend your entire life with. Right? There is absolutely one person you cannot get away from, no matter how good your boundaries are, uh, or no matter how great your resources are to keep resources are to keep running. You are going to spend your whole damn life with you. You need to be interesting to you. This is what I came to understand is at the very root essence of mental wellness is that you have put in the time and energy and dealt with the issues that arise about not fitting in, not being likable, not you know doing what your parents think you're supposed to do, etc., and moved through all of those basic levels of human – basic issues of human individuation – and have chosen to invest your time and energy in becoming someone that you're interested in. And I am not talking about self-love. I'm actually really specifically not talking about self-love, not talking about unconditional love, not talking about any of that. I'm talking brass tacks, reality, you are an interesting person for you to hang out with today. And if you're not... What are you going to do about it? Because that is actually what self-exploration, self-discovery, curiosity in yourself really means. It isn't about some crazy kumbaya self-love all the time or I'm perfect at this or fabulous at that. It's not even really about what is my soul's purpose. It's about in the process of discovering all of those things, I actually like being with myself while I'm doing it. Okay, so you need to like yourself, right? So my questions to explore then in contemplation, you got a lot of, some of you have a lot of time on your hands. I don't, frankly, but others do, right? Maybe things you could journey on if you don't have a lot of time on your hands, right? Ask. Delve deeply in a place of real honesty and curiosity and self-compassion, right? Do I live a life that I value? Or are the things I value not, you know, outside of my reach, not part of what I'm doing every day, right? Am I interesting to myself? Why? Why? What do I find interesting about being with myself? Right? What do I not find interesting about being with myself? My greatest motivation in life has been my profound boredom with myself. The boredom that arises out of addiction. The boredom that arises out of making the same stupid mistakes again and again in life. is my greatest motivating force in life is looking at the places that I'm really not interesting to myself at all and not getting involved in flogging and judgment and shame and blame and, oh, why am I such a whatever addict? But just say, dude, you're not interesting. We got to change this. We got to change this up. We got to figure this out. And then becoming curious. So how do we figure this out? How do I get out of this lifelong addiction to whatever? And actually become someone who is more interesting to me. What am I curious about in myself? To be at this age of this story that I've been sort of telling about coming to understand that I really needed to like myself. And I forgot the most important part of the story is when I came to this realization, I did not like myself much at all, actually. Okay, I realized a lot of that was learned behavior from how other people felt about me and that I actually didn't really agree with them. But it took a while to parse through all of that as well. But anyway, so what am I, well, ask yourself, if you don't find an answer, journey about it. What are you actually curious about in yourself? One of the things I was curious about in myself were the things that made me cry. 
especially cry in times other people weren't crying. Like why was I always crying at a place in the movie nobody else was? And why am I always laughing by myself in the movie theater? Why do I think different things are funny and not think the other things are funny? Like why? Right? There's this curiosity to what provokes my emotional response to things and why it's so not what everybody else is doing. It's really curious to me. Right? These things lead us somewhere. Do you spend your time and energy doing what matters to you? And that's a real question, especially for those of you whose lives are going to be different once they let us out again, right? How are you going to make your life different so that it has more things in it that matter to you and less things in it that don't matter? Because ultimately, as we parse our way through that and get usually a little bit older, begin to realize it tips from things that matter because there's some really practical things that matter. For example, when you're parenting, really practical everyday things that got to matter for a long time, right? But ultimately in life, we come to a place where we are asking what truly abides. And by that, I mean very specifically What do I cultivate in myself that does go with me at death? So much of what we spend so much time in evaporates instantaneously at death or simply doesn't matter about the quality of our death. What abides, meaning what changes, what cultivates the true nature of my soul through this lifetime and thus goes with me at my death? This is this little path of exploration is uh, for me has been the exploration inspired by the great spirits of the land, these deep old energies to move away from that which distracts and to focus on that which abides and to do so while you're young enough to cultivate a life that is uh, based on those values. And so these are things that are actually – a foundation for deep mental wellness that can stand a bit of rocking of the boat. Okay. And this ultimately turns into the path of cultivating the self. And so just to put this back into shamanism, since I've strayed a bit uh, from that specifically. So in Mass of Illusion and the Authentic Self, which is the first week of the cycle teachings – it's an awesome week, and and by the way, we've rescheduled the one that would have been this summer to this winter. It's been rescheduled to December for those of you that were trying to sort that out in your planning. Um, anyway, Massive Illusion, it's a week given us by OWL, and by design, by OWL's design, we move through a ritual sequence day, by, day in and day out, day by day. Until we we come to the, the culmination of that week, which is the actual awakening of your authentic self, which for many contemporary people is either utterly lost and asleep or somewhat asleep or something. But if we have a primary relationship with our authentic self, right? And so that authentic self is awakened and then the current self uh, re-bond, re, reestablishes its bond with the authentic self as this primary relationship in this life. It's wonderful and it works. And what we found is for a small percentage of the people, there's no real current self there to rebond with the authentic self. The authentic self can be reawakened through the ritual work with spirit. But there's no true current self that has any kind of true mental wellness and resiliency to greet that authentic self and reforge that relationship and course correct in life to move in that direction. Okay, that little thing I just said is a really big deal, by the way. Not the point of the show, but a big deal, right? That through your shamanic work and the power of ritual and the power of the group, you can potentially reawaken your kind of right relationship with the authentic self without really having a true self 
present to do it. And this is part of the challenge that I see as people's mental wellness is crumbling in this time of quarantine is that your wellness, I'm saying now in air quotes, your wellness is largely dependent on being bolstered up by infusions of spirit energies and drawing on energies outside of yourself constantly, just as we need to constantly drink water. But these energies are not really there to be a constant resource when, of a quality of internal sense of self that you're really meant to be cultivating out of your own juices, basically, out of your own curiosity your own interest, your own values, and out of the things that matter to you in your life. And that you are really meant to have the courage to stand up and say, this is me. This is what matters to me. This is the person I need to be to be interesting to myself. And so this is who I am. And so my, my sense is that this step is absolutely fundamental to establish resilient and hearty, ongoing, deal with weird things happening in the world kind of mental wellness that is not so easily undermined by, you know, eight weeks in quarantine at home. So the next step in building a foundation for your mental wellness is cultivating the capacity for solitude. And so solitude is the ability to be alone without being lonely. Now, obviously, there's a corollary with this and my first story about spending my life alone. It means cultivating um, a great capacity for solitude. But what I would like to add today is, is that Solitude is really actually the ability to be alone without distraction, without being lonely. And so this is the other thing that has crashed people's fake mental wellness balloons, right? Is now that I don't have all of my distractions, my mental wellness clicked over into unwellness, mental unwellness pretty quickly without distraction. And that my, my lack of sort of the everyday distractions of my life, sending my energy out of myself, projecting it out onto others, being engaged external from myself, that now that this has collapsed, um, it's exposing um, the sort of darker cousins of that habit of distraction, which is those deeper addictions that flare up when we're not distracting ourselves. Right. And so instead of focusing on I have to fix my addictions right now, why don't you just try moving some of your energy and time and resources into practicing solitude? And don't get crazy, you know, just or or do get crazy, but don't get crazy. Just start with five minutes and add to it. Do it in different ways. But find ways to be truly alone without distraction and be with yourself and not immediately go into loneliness and the need to distract from that. Because at the heart of our loneliness for whatever we can't get to right now, is this loneliness for self. It's the fact that the, the time and energy has not been invested in your own relationship with yourself so that you're someone you like to be in solitude with. And so the thing about being in solitude is it's at least twofold, if not more, Now, one aspect of solitude is what you probably already think I'm talking about, which would be what I would call the more meditative solitude. I'm taking a day for myself, um, sitting in meditation, going for a hike alone. Um, This kind of time spent in a more meditative solitude, which is fine, was not really what I was thinking about. 
I was really thinking about you and your interests. How deep is your bench, right? Do you have one superstar interest, like sex or something like that? One thing that you, you're, you're really thinking about all the time, really wanting to do, and the rest of your bench, right, is not very kind of lackluster interests that aren't really all that interesting. It's just things you think you should do. Like I'm just thinking, so as shamanic practitioners, someone told you you should make your own drum. Maybe you should make a rattle. Maybe you should do this, do that. You've got all these interests there on your bench, but you don't really want to do those things. Right? What are you really interested in? You know, maybe you're really interested in jazz music. You just can't figure out how that fits into your shamanic journey circle. It's like, so what is the depth and breadth of your interests and how deep are you willing to go into them with honest and intimate engagement? Because I know we are all really good these days about going down totally obsessive, addictive rat holes. The internet is filled with them. I, I don't mean that kind of scoping down escape from yourself. I'm talking about sitting in solitude with yourself, engaged in something that you find deeply interesting. And being alone in that engagement with your thoughts. Okay? Or... Allowing yourself then to express in solitude through your interests where your values really are in your life and to be creative about what, how you would express yourself in solitude or explore yourself in solitude, I guess, is what I really mean. Because solitude ultimately... When you can be in it without being stressed out by it, you know, without watching the clock. Can I, you know, I've done my 15 minutes, I can get out now. But when solitude becomes a place you're happy to hang out in for as ever long as you need to, then you begin to have um, discovered the quality of time and energy that is needed to settle into yin cultivation. The true cultivation of that energy I spoke to as I, I did the invocation in the beginning of the podcast, that quality of the earth energy that is before everything that is life on earth, that which is the same, that is this potential that is before, that energy is the depth of yin we need to tap to truly begin to cultivate yin energies, which are then the support for all of our expression in our life. And so this is the message from the warrior. We had the message from owl and the healer about cultivating a self, but the message from the warrior is about in, in essence, wrestling with your pathetic small demons to be able to be in solitude, to be able to be alone with yourself, to settle deeply into that which you value and have interest in and tap in to that energy that is before, energy that becomes what it is you might want to do with your life. Right? So it is a, a place of cultivation to be able to be in solitude and to enjoy yourself in solitude. And then the third piece, one is liking yourself, right? The next is cultivate a vast capacity for solitude. You know, so you have more solitude than you um, need. <laughs> so the final thing would be to cultivate a capacity for to be in silence. And this, again, was not anything I figured out for myself because I was smart or anything. I was alone in Manhattan, very lost, very confused why I was there and what was going on. And I was trying to study Qigong without any resources. And so I was reading um, books by Montak Chia and his wife at that time, whose name is escaping me at the moment. But anyway, um, in these books, 
they, they almost always go through the same things in the beginning in the preparation to do qigong but one of them is to cultivate a capacity for silence to cultivate a capacity to be in silence and so it means no soundtrack right no tv in the background no music in the background you know no podcast in the background no earbuds right no no constant auditory background to what you're doing silence you know what does it mean to be in silence and most people will automatically go i can't be in silence because i'm in the city it's too noisy here i can't be out in nature where it's silent well y'all haven't been out in nature much then nature's really noisy <laughs> if you've ever tried to live in a tent for a long period of time you know that nature is exceptionally noisy and it has its own uh time schedule all right i you have no idea if you think nature is quiet because it isn't. It's actually very noisy. So the point is silence is an aspect of inner cultivation. And again, it's a capacity. You, you, you've created a habit of always having the distraction of your soundtrack. And there's nothing wrong with loving music and appreciating your artists and paying for their work and listening and enjoying and that needs to be balanced by silence and stillness. And, it, and, and again, it's just cultivating this capacity to be with yourself in a state that allows depth. And out of that depth comes the deep roots of mental wellness. Now, mental wellness is, of course, woven through emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being as well. But... The mental wellness piece is the place where you are choosing where to place your attention, what to do with your time, right? And so what's critical about all of these aspects I'm talking about is, one, that they're not going into these things through obsession and escaping from the self, which is the obsessive piece, that we are going deeply into the self in curiosity and exploration and learning, just learning more about you and who you are and why you do what you do and why you care about what you care about because it changes. But what's important about these inner states is that we do them in a way that does not increase stagnation. And by that, I mean really getting your energy stuck, which is why I was suggesting aspects of um, solitude that are not just meditative but that you find ways to be in solitude that involve a kind of movement so you move out of stagnation in your silence and your stillness and your solitude and out of suffocation so suffocation comes through closed-mindedness being positional being um not being curious I mean, one of the most suffocating mental states is a lack of curiosity, a refusal to learn from life. So this is what I would encourage those of you that find yourself bored, you've got nothing to do, you're scrolling too much, spending too much time playing games, that uh, it, playing mindless video games versus a big old board game with everybody in your household, whatever. I encourage you to drop deeply into asking what is essential um, and that it – what is essential is that you have the power to change as long as you are breathing. You will be more real, more truly you if you spend your time and energy and contemplation of the things that matter to you right now. Don't distract from your situation. Use your situation to discover what do you care about? This isn't about fixing yourself or about working all the time or about any of these arguments that I hear about why you shouldn't feel guilty about being bored and wasting your day. This is about encouraging you to be someone that you like being with. And if you aren't, if you aren't someone you like being with, right? What needs to change? What can't change, literally? You're like, no matter how much weight I lose, my legs will not be longer. I can't change that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but what can you change? Even if it's hard, 
There's a lot of things people say, I can't change that, and they can. They just choose not to. And especially, don't worry about the fact that making this change is going to make you a weirdo. So what? With the things you need to change if you were to become someone that you like, someone who is interesting to you, someone who is curious about your life, someone who lives a life built on what you value and what matters the most to you. What can change if you need new skills? If you just had new skills, go get them. What can change if you just had different resources, right? Well, what resources can you transform from one thing to another so that you have the skills and the resources to change what you need to change to become a person that you are interested in, that you really like and you want to hang out with. So I want to give thanks to all of the many energies that brought in these lessons in my younger life. I'm deeply grateful for them today, grateful to the earth below and the sky above and to all the energies that stand around us, grateful for the heart that unites us all. I did want to say a few things. These are the things I should have been doing the show about if I was good at marketing, but I'm not. Oh, I'm just going to run through them really quickly. So the Shadow Transformation Protocol with me begins online tomorrow night, which is April 22nd, 2020. Massive Illusion and the Authentic Self in this year, 2020, has been moved to new December dates. So if you're interested in joining us, you can reach out to me to find out about that now. Sandra Ingerman has extended her registration for her online course, Shamanic Practices for Spiritual Immunity. There's a link for that on the Why Shamanism Now Facebook page pinned to the top of the page. You can register there for that online course. And as I said earlier in the show, Sounds True Resilience in Challenging Times remains free and excellent at SoundsTrue.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week.